without the strength to exert your will onto the world, you also lack the strength to exert your ideas onto the world. And without the will or without the power to exert your ideas onto the world, your ideas become null and void. Without power, ideas mean nothing. That is the first priority, is to have the ability to actually impact change through action onto the world. Yukio Mishima, a Japanese author, poet, playwright, actor, model, Shintoist, nationalist, and founder of the Tatenokai uh, society. He was a very prolific figure in Japanese philosophy, and he was the writer of Sun and Steel, which is a book that talks about his life and some of his philosophies regarding the mind, body, and spirit and their unification. Today, we want to have a little debate, just conversation, enlighten each other on our views regarding this unification he talks of. And we hope you enjoy it. I'm going to hand it over to Patrick because he is very knowledgeable on Mishima. So go ahead, let us know what you think of him and some background on him. Right. And the background is incredibly important when you want to try to understand the psychology of Yukio Mishima. His story is very much a story of overcoming. And it is a story of overcoming of one who lives in the sort of uh, theoretical world, the world the world of pure imagination, the world of words, uh, as he calls it, and one who overcomes that through physical action. And the reason why Mishima, Mishima's philosophy is, is pushes this idea of, of the mind and the body, the fusion of the mind and the body, is because... The body to him is the physical manifestation necessary for ideas, for words. Without them, these words are meaningless and they don't have value. So just to briefly sort of summarize his life, uh, Yukio Mishima was born to a relatively well-off family. They had ties to, to a long line of samurai. And though the samurai officially lost their status, in uh, the 1870s, shortly after the Meiji Restoration, they still had a lot of power that transferred over to the, the New Japan. So a lot of these samurai families that were prominent uh, for hundreds of years retained that prominence, and Mishima was no different. He was born into a very good family. Uh, he had a good education. He also had a sort of strange upbringing early in his life, and you can see this if you've ever watched the uh, Mishima film, which is very good, and I recommend it to everybody. It's a good introduction if you want to start getting into Mishima's books. But he was early on raised by his grandmother, and his grandmother was this sort of elitist, uh, old aristocratic Japanese woman. And when I mean aristocratic, I mean it in a traditional Japanese way. So... He was raised by her. He was kept away from his mother and his father because his grandma was very neurotic. She uh, was very protective of him. She didn't let him go outside and play. She kept him inside. And because of this, Mishima grows up as a very brooding young boy, a very brooding child. He's quiet. He's very contemplative. He lives in his mind, which, which makes a lot of sense when you start to go through his story. Uh, eventually, he, he moves back with his mother and he grows up. And as he's growing up, he becomes entranced with words. He becomes entranced with creating beautiful stories and poetry. And he actually gets a lot of acclaim early on in his life, even before he's an adult. Uh, he, he attracted the attention of a lot of, a lot of writers. And he was, a lot of times what he had to do was he had to uh, publish or disseminate his work anonymously because his father uh, did not support this this uh, writing career he saw it as foolish so much so that he eventually set up uh, Mishima with a job in the Ministry of Finance which is a very cushy well-paying and prestigious job Mishima's story I think is is really takes off during World War II in 1944 1945 see Mishima went to the uh, the sort of draft examination board with with uh, doctors and whatnot and he faked an illness. In his writing, he wrote about how he wanted to die in battle, to die gloriously, to die for the emperor. When the time came, he took the coward's way out. And he said, you know, he, he came up with this, this fake illness, which was, um, I believe he faked tuberculosis. And for the rest of his life, he was deeply ashamed of this. And I think a lot of his spiritual transformation 
comes as a result of him regretting that, regretting his cowardice and wanting to overcome that cowardice. And he realized no matter how much he believed in ideals like dying for the emperor or how much he believed in the sort of purity of Japan and this, this very rich cultural history, without action, he would never be able to act upon these ideals. And, and early on in his life, even after that, he was, he was very skinny, he was very frail, he was very weak. And for a lot of his life, this continued up until he took a trip to Greece in around, I want to say, 1953. And um, in ni around that time, he, he saw these Greek statues, right? And the Greek aesthetic ideal is very important and something that will come up in this conversation, no doubt, and, and why I'm going to be arguing for, for the body being incredibly important and sometimes more important than the mind, which I know is something we disagree on and that'll be an interesting conversation. But the Greek aesthetic is is beauty. It's beauty, but well, well, then we ask, well, what is beauty? And for the Greek, beauty has a functional quality about it. See, these beautiful men who are strong, who are fast, who are who are virile. It was it was for a reason. It was it was uh, important for warfare. It was important to project the power of the Greeks. Without power, the Greeks could not have all the free time that they did to be able to pursue the arts, to be able to pursue the sciences. Being skilled at war allowed them to subjugate other peoples and have slaves. People don't realize this about Athens is that people call it a democracy, but they're an aristocratic democracy. They have, they had many people who were not citizens. It was only a specific class of people that were citizens and they were citizens because they pursued the ideal, the physical ideal. They made themselves strong and fast and, and, and intelligent to be great warriors. And this allowed them the free time because they worked off the labor of the freeman class and the slave class. But what I'm getting at here is that Mishima recognized this. He recognized the aesthetic ideal and he realized that all these, these uh, ideas that lived only in his imagination meant nothing if there could not be a physical representation of them. And that, and that first of all required the use of the body, a strong and beautiful body. And so when he gets back to Japan, he takes up bodybuilding and he takes up karate. He takes up boxing. He takes up kendo, which is essentially swordsmanship with uh, wooden swords. Uh, he takes up all these, these sort of martial things. He forms uh, Tatanokai, which is the, the shield society, which is um, his, his militia group, his private army, so to speak. They were unarmed because of the Japanese law, but they trained alongside the Japanese defense forces. He himself went through basic training. Um, under his real name. He didn't want to use his pen name because he didn't want people to realize he was a celebrity. He wanted the real soldier's experience. He takes a lot of steps to overcome that past of cowardice and of weakness because no matter how beautiful his words were, and he talks about this, he talks, in, you, you probably remember this, the cross of nature of words in Sun and Steel. Mm -hmm. um, to all that is, is incredibly beautiful and even his early writing is incredibly beautiful, but Things don't mean anything without these physical uh, manifestations for them. Things don't mean anything if if one does not use those ideals to impact and exert their will over the world around them. That's That's the crux of it. If you have these ideals and they live only in, in your head, they live only in the realm of imagination, then they don't amount to anything in terms of actual force and actual action. And he understood this. So by pursuing all these things, it gave him the strength to sort of project his ideals in reality. And eventually this culminates in him taking his shield society, I believe it was four other members, three or four other members, and they essentially take the base commandant hostage because they had an, uh, an interview with him and they took him hostage and Mishima tried to incite a revolt or a coup d'etat to restore the emperor of Japan as the god ruler of the country. And of course he failed. And upon realizing his failure, he committed seppuku, which is ritual suicide, plunging a blade into his stomach as his second, uh, w which was one of his followers, uh, cut off his head. And this, that was a little bit of a long introduction, but I think it's important to know all these things. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Mishima. But I present this introduction as a means of trying to illustrate this is a man who lived as a very intelligent person, someone who understood concepts and ideals, but was incomplete 
without the ability to manifest those ideals physically. Because ultimately, no matter what, no matter how smart you are, you cannot do anything without power. And this, I think, is the aesthetic ideal of, of, of um, Mishima, of the Greeks, and of Nietzsche too. Uh, Nietzsche talks about this, and I'm sure this will come up again because it's going to be a big, a big part of this discussion is, is uh, what is philosophy without the powerful body to exert that philosophy on the world. So uh, because I've gone on a little bit, I'm going to cut it off there and uh, sort of, I guess you can present your opening statement, so to speak. I'll probably start by asking questions because I first want to understand why people who are so infatuated with Sun and Steel, for example, because I think that's one of his most popular books when it comes to introductory level into his um, writing. Yes. I kind of want to understand why you're so appreciative of the mind-body dynamic mm -hmm. and why you think it's important in the first place. Yeah, so like I said, without the strength to exert your will onto the world, you also lack the strength to exert your ideas onto the world. And without the will or without the power to exert your ideas onto the world, your ideas become null and void. Without power, ideas mean nothing. That is the first priority, is to have the ability to actually impact change through action onto the world. So for example, let's say you have an ideal of helping others, for instance, right? Um, and and this is this isn't one of the ideals that uh, necessarily that Mishima or Nietzsche or any of these guys uh, uphold. But like, let's say for example, right? Let's say helping people, right, was one of your goals. Well, it doesn't matter how well you could articulate. We need to help others. It doesn't matter how well you could explain to somebody the positives and benefits of helping others, unless you have the power to actually do it unless you have the resources to help others, unless you have the ability to actually help others. And what I'm getting at here is you can have all the theory and all the concepts and all these ideas, right? But without the actual function of implementing these ideas or these theories or these policies even when it comes to governance, then it doesn't matter. You need to have the body to be able to exert your will and implement these ideas in real life. Um, because no matter what, even if you're a really smart person, right, and you're not out there on the front lines fighting, let's say you're an Oppenheimer, right? Oppenheimer cannot be Oppenheimer without people doing the grunt work. So at a certain point, somebody's physical power is necessary. Um, in some part of this hierarchy, in some part of this, this structure of work. So um, I guess that even if you're not the guy doing the grunt work, Having the strong body gives you a special perspective that you would not have if you had a frail body. Uh, Mishima talks about this when he talks about the the resentment that weak and frail people have towards the hero. They try to demonize the hero. They try to demonize the sort of masculine virtue of strength because they say, you know, well, it's not necessary. It's not needed, right? And that's Rizantama, as Nietzsche talks about. Rizantama is envy. That's of the weak and the sort of ugly and the person who lacks power towards the one who has strength, power, and beauty. And this resentima, this envy, it, it, it starts off as like, you know, they, them trying to justify why they're in the position they are. So you've ever like had somebody who's unsuccessful, right? And um, let's say they like party all the time. Like they go out, they go drinking every weekend. You know, some people can, can balance it, you know, drinking and, and also being uh, fabulous, <laughs> but uh, most people, <laughs> most people, you know, are going to do that to their detriment. Or let's say I smoke weed all the time, right? And let's say you used to smoke weed th with them. You know, you, you and your friends smoked weed all the time. And then one day you're sick of it. You're tired of it. You're like, I don't want to smoke weed anymore. I want to do something with my life. So you say, I'm going to quit smoking weed. Do you think that person's going to be supportive of you? Do you think he's going to, uh, you know, the friends you're talking about? Yeah. The one who smokes weed with you every day. I think it really depend, depends on the friend, but maybe as a general rule, and I think this is what you're getting at, yeah. no, they wouldn't really be supportive because they probably inherently know it's not a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And so to see positive action would make them feel negative towards it. Right. It would, it would make them see their own mediocrity. So they have to, because like, what, if, you're, if you're smoking weed every day, right? Like, it's like uh, misery loves company. If you're a miserable person, you don't want to see other people happy because it, then it shows you that you actually have control over your happiness, that you have control over your life. 
And that's a scary thing for some people because people like to blame their lives on something. Without something to blame, things become very scary for people because they have to face themselves in the mirror. They have to stay up at night thinking that this is their fault. And I think it's the same thing with the sort of mind-body distinction. A lot of times the people that argue that you should not have a strong and powerful body or whatever do so because they themselves don't have it. I think that regardless, right, at a certain point, you need physical strength, you need physical force on some level of the hierarchy. Somebody has to do it, right? But even beyond that, there is the mental aspect of it too. Without the the strong body, without you yourself understanding what it takes to achieve the strong body, without you yourself being the highest level you can be, uh, you're always going to have an element of yourself, whether consciously or subconsciously, that resents or is envious towards the person who has maximized their ideals. And I think that almost anybody can reach their physical limits, right? And most people's physical limits aren't aren't too far off. Um, obviously, some people are, are born weaker than others, but for the most part, I think there's more of a disparity in intelligence than there is a disparity of physicality. So when I say, for example, sometimes the physical ideal is superior to the intellectual ideal, is because I think at a certain level, it is a lot more possible for people to reach the physical ideal than the mental ideal because there's less of a disparity. So I guess what I'm getting at is we can all be strong, we can all be virile, and we can all be as, as beautiful as we can make ourselves to be. And that the people that choose not to, the people that choose to ignore the physical ideal are not doing so because the function is is bad they're not doing so because like oh i have so much work to do i don't have any time no they're probably going to go home and play video games for two or three hours or they're going to do something else whatever it's like people have time everybody has time to reach a, a, a good level of, of physical strength and physical beauty but they choose not to so i guess what i'm getting at is it is absolutely important because otherwise your whole psyche and the way that you view things is going to be skewed in in a very negative direction does that sort of make sense I understand it. I would question whether or not it actually does skew your perception of things in a negative sense. Because um, one thing, I was talking to a friend actually originally when I heard of Mishima, mm -hmm. that I don't think it's so much about uh, physicality. It's about a pursuit of greatness that he's talking about, mm -hmm. which I think that's more so the symbolic um, aspect of working out. Say, for example, someone plays the violin. Yeah. And they spend tens of thousands of hours. I think that even though it has a different function in terms of uh, if it makes you physically beautiful or strong, it d has the same mental function in terms of this pursuit of greatness. Would you agree with that? So I would say that in terms of scale, like impact, yes. However, on a very individual level, I disagree. Like if you have somebody who's obese and playing the violin, like... You know, we're very lucky to to be listening to that, right? So their impact on the world might be the same as, as a fit person playing that same level of violin. Mm. However, on an individual level, and this goes back to evolutionary psychology as well, uh, we are not created as humans to be satisfied being obese because we would not survive being obese. You know, more importantly, we probably would not be obese at all. If you think about uh, obesity, you can't have obesity without agriculture. Agriculture, agriculture has been around for like, what, 10, 12,000 years at most. Humans have been around for 300,000 years. The entirety of our evolutionary psychology, pretty much, like 95% of it, has been geared towards the lean, agile, quick, uh, good cardio body to be able to hunt down prey, to be able to migrate, to be able to be constantly moving. That's how our psychology is orchestrated. Our, our psychology is structured so that we don't feel satisfied. We don't feel full even. Like we're not used to abundance in nature. Our psychology tells us, you know, you have to constantly be moving. You have to constantly be be attacking, right? Um, our eyes are fixed forward, like I said before, because we are predators. And what I'm getting at here is I don't think people can truly be happy unless they're physically healthy. They can't truly be fulfilled. And the reason why that messes with the psyche, and, and you know, here's the thing. So you could say, well, let's say there is this obese violin player, right? And you have uh, a physically fit violin player and they play the same level of violin. Then, yeah, technically the function is 
these violin players are are both creating something beautiful for society to consume and that's a good thing in that sense their contribution is the same however and i will say what comes with the physical physically ideal body there's 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 other factors that go into it that are also going to impact something like playing the violin like discipline for instance anyone can have a disciplined diet somebody who overeats or whatever right that's a lack of discipline somebody who does not take care of themselves by being healthy that's a lack of discipline um if anything right especially when it comes to like fat specifically you see a lot of twisted artists who are who who maybe forget to eat for a few days because they're so focused on this beautiful piece of art uh but it makes no sense to think well here's this guy you know he didn't have any time because he was uh working on his art for three days straight but he actually gained 30 pounds so i guess what i'm getting at here is especially when we talk about obesity specifically it is the mark of somebody whose mind is not right because of the factors that go into a physically ideal body the factors that go into a physically ideal body in the attainment and retention of one ultimately are also factors that influence somebody's ability to hone a skill so my argument would be yes if in theory and hypothetically you have somebody who is out of shape and they're performing at the same level as somebody who's in shape and it is something that does not require physicality, like playing the violin, and they're both creating something equally beautiful to society, sure, but I would wager that you're going to have a lot fewer obese, wonderful violin players than you would physically fit violin players. And on top of that, assuming that you do have a violin player who's obese who is as good as the fit one, that person will never be right with themselves on a psychological level because they are living unnaturally. They're living in a way that the body is, is screaming, this is wrong. The body is weird. It's hypocritical. The body wants you to sit down and lay down all day on your couch and, and gorge on Cheetos, but that's because the body is not antiquated for the couch. It's not antiquated for Cheetos. It's antiquated for whenever you do get rest, you should take it because there's no rest in the wild. There's no rest in nature. So our bodies are hypocritical, but what stays constant is the psyche, the soul, if you want to call it that. The soul will never be satisfied with this ugly body. And I mean ugly on a physical health level, right? You can't help it if you have a fucked up nose, you know? I mean, I guess you could get a nose job, but not, I'm playing. But um, yeah, you get what I'm, 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 I'm trying to say? Like, no matter what, either you're going to be, you're not going to reach that ideal because of the factors that go into unhealth versus healthiness or even if you somehow did you're never going to be right with yourself there's always going to be a problem with your psyche so what about the violin player who's obese if they were to get physically fit would they then be better than the violin player who's already physically fit but um plays the same amount like what benefit does it have to make it what i would argue comes off as a necessity in sun and steel like of great importance mm -hmm. because still in my opinion it's it's maybe a sufficient condition for certain aspects of perception but for example i played sports my whole life yeah and uh, the reason i actually stopped playing sports and lost a lot of interest in it was because of philosophy and introducing things to my brain kind of to question the meaning of well what is the point of winning anyway like what is the point of this sort of uh i guess ferocious strength mm -hmm. it didn't make sense to me and at that point it became entirely meaningless i i, I when i boxed i won both my matches and i wasn't sad when i won but mm -hmm. i certainly wasn't ecstatic either because i knew at the end of the day it, it's just a drop in the bucket to me it was pretty insignificant and i question if it is so important maybe i'm an outlier but to me having th this like kind of combining some philosophical aspects with my training mm -hmm. i don't know i've never seen a correlation that makes me go wow this is a necessity that i need to hold on to if i want to uh develop uh, incredible thoughts or incredible mm -hmm. philosophies it just seemed unrelated to me yeah, so I mean, there's three different things to look at with that. So first of all, you know, you come from like, first having the physical and then 
pursuing the mental, so to speak. And not to say you're stupid before, but like, you know, you didn't have, you didn't have to work for the physicality. It came to you naturally. And I feel the same way for myself. So I can understand that. So that's the first thing to establish, right? Mishima does not have that same uh, yeah. sort of thing, right? He has the, the, the great rationale first and then the physicality later. Another thing to consider, right, is you could just be an outlier or, I mean, there's different ways that victory um, impacts different people. People find different kinds of victories more or less rewarding, right? So, of course, there's that to factor in as well. I know personally, um, and I've said this before in different podcasts, like the one feeling that is better than sex is victory. And maybe that sounds a little weird, but like I, 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 I truly mean that. Like um, whenever I've won martial arts competitions, that was the best single best feeling in those moments of victory. So it's different for each person, right? It's a value thing as well. Um, some people, the greatest joy they'll have in life is, for example, and it's probably true for most people, having children, for example, right? And that's fine. But for every good family man, right? You have a hundred good family men. You also need that one person who is dissatisfied, who is not satisfied with basic life, like a, like a Napoleon type who, who aspires to more and who propels his collective group forward. You always need that one person. So I guess what, what I'm trying to get at is, yeah, there is, there's different ways to approach that. But having said that, the overarching instinct, which I think makes victory and, and by extension makes the physical important is that I'll ask you this. So you pursue philosophy. You don't have to be physically fit by function, right? Mm -hmm. Like not for some practical function. I would argue you do. Yes. I would see, I would argue you do, but we have not the ramifications of, of not being a healthy society have not caught up with us. So I'll, I'll, I'll picture you this right now. We live in a lull in the, in the sort of um, big explosions of conflict and war. This is not normal. It is not normal to live in peace, even in American history. We were fighting the American and Indian wars up to, I believe the early 1900s to, to a small degree. Um, the Civil War was not that long ago, when you think about it. 200 years is not that long. Less than 200 years, really. Um, World War World War I was not that long ago. World War I was only above 100 years ago. World War II was less than 100 years ago. The Vietnam War was was um, like 40 years ago. GWAT, the Global War on Terrorism, just ended three years ago. The difference is that the scale of war was larger in the past, but it's slowly getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, and part of that is because, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, there's like a, there's been a short triumph of liberalization throughout the world. Um, mm -hmm. like you have, when, when more countries share a uh, liberal ideology, there is less conflict. However, more now that tolerance. you, see, was that more tolerance, even if that's not always a good thing. Yeah. You know, conflict comes out in different ways as we've discussed before, like economically, mm -hmm. But um, war was right. Uh, but but look at look what's happening today. The the world is at war. There was a freaking coup d'état in Bolivia yesterday. Um, the Russo Ukraine war is still going on. Literally like um, you know look at Israel Palestine. Israel might invade uh, Lebanon now. China is growing in strength. They're they're fucking with the Filipinos in the Philippines, like ramming their boats and stuff like that. Like we live in an unnatural point of history. This is not normal. The fact that you can just focus on philosophy is very rare. And I brought up the Greeks earlier. I think that's important to mention. The Greeks had the ability to pursue philosophy because they pursued warfare. They had the carrot and the stick, so to speak, but they always carried the stick at their rear. And of course, you can argue that there's um, very extreme versions of this, like take Sparta, for example, where all their citizens only dedicate themselves to warfare, right? But even the Athenians, mm -hmm. the Athenians were very skilled at war. And, you know, you can't look at them as these sort of peaceful, you know, people living under democratic ideals. It's not the case. Um, they were all soldiers. Socrates was a soldier, right? Plato's academy also taught the arts of war. Um, all these people that you look up to, like you and I, were soldiers because they had to be because the only way that they could pursue these extra things was if they did the minimum and and even going beyond the minimum because the minimum is not enough doing everything you can to retain your power the for, the sort of um the necessary condition to, for any of this is existence that's just straight up first you have to exist and existence requires power 
And power requires having the tools to wield power. It's like, like I said, no matter what in the hierarchy, somebody is doing the grunt work. Somebody is doing the labor work, right? And I would argue that the more of us that are capable of doing that, the better. It is not that difficult for somebody to spend like two hours a day um, going to the gym and, and learning a martial art or even one hour a day. Um, or even one hour a week, people don't even do that. So I guess what I'm getting at is I would disagree in saying that it's not necessary anymore. We just live in a lull between the chaos, which make, gives us the false impression, the illusion that we don't need these things, that we don't need to be skilled at war. I think we absolutely do. And I think this is going to prove itself to be true in the next uh, 10 years, especially with as tensions rise with China, as um, climate can have an impact. On, on third world countries and, and cause mass migrations from countries that literally can't sustain themselves, this is going to create a lot of conflict due to the scramble of resources. And you're going to see again that these things are necessary. So that would be my argument is that the feelings you have, and, and they're, they're probably normal. Most people feel that way, like, right? Like we, we, you know, we live in a pretty safe bubble. Even in America, that's not true. Even in America, you go to your inner city there's people shooting each other up every single day. There's, there's, you know, if you want to talk about mass shootings, people don't realize a mass shooting happens every few days, but it just happens not at schools. It happens amongst gangs in these uh, inner city neighborhoods. Like even in America, people are living in a constant state of war. But because we're not exposed to that, we have this false reality imposed upon us where we think we don't have to pursue these things. And I would argue that Mishima hits it on the hits the uh, nail on the head and so do the Greeks, and so does Nietzsche, that peace is unnatural. And preparing for peace is a bad thing. It's a vice. And it's like the old Chinese proverb. It's better to be a warrior in a garden, a garden than a gardener in war. And um, no matter how you feel, like somebody like me, I, I relish in, in the pursuit of these sort of things, like pursuit of power, martial arts, strength. I relish in that. Like that gives me a lot of joy. But even if it doesn't for you, I would say it's still a necessity. We just don't have is it just we can't see the necessity right now if that makes sense mm -hmm. if i had a choice to turn the entire world into philosophers or the entire world into warriors i definitely pick philosophers every time because i still think even if it's necess necessary in terms of if there's a impending war regardless of the situation i think it's uh preferable to help people develop intellect and critical thinking where this necessity of strength even though i i consider it important because of health reasons more than um some sort of war warlike reasons but even still if more people had some sort of coherent thought and ability to interact with others on a i guess respectful level would these disasters even come about and i think the way you stop that is through the mind not through domination domination you can obviously stop it eventually but it's not really a solution it's just i think you know what i'm kind of getting at with yeah. this i don't i don't know if i consider it a solution just going to war so i would argue that we there is no solution and there never will be a solution so this is the sort of distinction between the right and the left is a distinction between nietzsche and hegel and you know i know you're a big fan of zizek and zizek is a very big hegelian and the hegelian mm -hmm. idea is that history progresses forward towards a specific end, which is the ideal end. He was a German idealist. And what this means is, from the Hegelian point of view, as we develop culturally, we become more and more, let's say, virtuous. And we, we come up with these progressive ideas that are more and more correct. And eventually, at the end of history, we'll reach the end where everything is perfect. That's the Hegelian view. And this is, in some extent, shared by Zizek and shared by Marx. They believe that if you get rid of certain what they believe are uh, abstractions or you get rid of certain mm -hmm. things like property, for example, um, consumerism, that life will self-correct. And I think I've had this conversation with you before and we kind of talked about it last week uh, or two weeks ago, um, which is the distinction between Rousseau and Hobbes. Rousseau also is a leftist thinker and he's also in the same line as Hegel, Marx and Zizek. They believe if you take away these these um Diff these sort of uh, abstractions, as you might call them, property, uh, 
you know, over, over possession of goods, whatever inequality of goods between people, they believe if you take away all of that, everything's going to be better. And that sounds similar to what you're saying with, well, if everyone is a philosopher. And there's a few issues I have with that. There's human nature, which is rooted in will to power. And there's the sort of reality that I think we actually are. So really quick to go back to human nature. First of all, I see turning everyone into philosophers as impossible because of the mental disparity I talked about. There's a far mm -hmm. greater disparity in intelligence than there is in physicality between most human types. You'll see, take sports, for example, right? Um, now, skill comes into line with sports, but generally speaking, physically, um, each country has its own strengths, right? Uh, but they have their own places where they... Uh, What's the word? They, they do better. They excel. Now, there's a few countries that don't excel very well, like India and China, for example, despite having billions of people. And there's countries like Croatia with like three million people and they like win all this, these fucking medals. So, you know, there's some disparities, <laughs> but for the most part, right, like, you know, Japanese are very good at baseball, for example. Like, who would have thought that? You know, that's so random. Um, you have, you know, South America are very good at soccer. You have um, excellent... Uh, uh, runners from from like uh, Africa and and by extension Jamaica, you know America's good at what we are good at. Europe's good at what they're good at. The point is like you have most pe most people like most continents throughout the world, no matter what, people excel physically. This is something that is relatively more average across the world. Intelligence is not the case at all. If you look at this disparity between different continents in terms of like average IQ, it's vastly different. Um, Japan and China. Are, are leagues ahead of the rest of the world. Um, if you took the country with the lowest IQ and the highest IQ, and these, these tests are flawed because somehow Nepal got a 42 on IQ tests. And I don't think that's like possible. So take it with a grain of salt, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but according to this test, there was a 60 point disparity between Japan and Nepal. And I, 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 like I said, I don't agree with the results because I don't think that's like literally possible. But... Mm -hmm. The point is, is that there's more of a disparity in intellect than there is in physicality. So when you say, couldn't we just turn everyone in the world into philosophers? I don't think you could. You, the only way you could technically do that is if you picked all the intelligent people in the world and just got rid of everybody else. And obviously, uh, not, we can't do that. It's not practical. And maybe it's not uh, ethical from your point of view either, right? Mm -hmm. um, but first of all, I would say that it's, it's not possible. Secondly... I would say that the way that human nature works, even if somehow you got everyone to be a philosopher, everyone to be intelligent, everyone to think critically, let's say you've established that, you have the same issue you get with anarcho-Marxism. So the end stage of Marxism is anarchism, essentially. Now that's been changed with, with sort of the, the neo-Marxist uh, idea, but even, in, even with Lenin, right? Um, even Lenin, though he, he incorporates the, the state as a means of leading to that sort of anarchy, that's still technically the end goal. And what this presupposes is that in the state of anarchy, everybody's going to have non-aggression principle and not mess with the sort of anarchic har hier or harmony, that nobody's going to mess it up. And this presupposes, that let's say 7 billion people live in this anar anarchy paradise, that out of 7 billion people, not one is going to try to challenge the system. And that's just not realistic. People crave power. They crave inequality. This is the natural state of man is to crave power and to crave inequality. Inequality is what distinguishes human types. It's what gives one person more than the other. And I think this is something that people will always want. And I'll, I'll give you a good example in a second. Uh, remind me to bring up sexual inequality if I forget to bring that up. But there's always going to be somebody who does not feel a part of this. And in an, anar in an anarchy, there is no overarching authority besides the collective that actually enforces uh, law. Technically, the idea with anarchy is that if somebody goes against the anarchy, everybody else will gang up on them, right? In theory. But that, that there's just so many negative implications that could come from that. Um, and it's impossible for corruption not to arise as soon as you need an authority to sort of quell unrest. As soon as somebody rebels against the system, they are going to have to uh, dissolve aspects of the anarchical government and form to some level of authority. So by function, they're doomed for failure the same way a democracy is doomed for failure oftentimes because you have to have people that 
Like people have to vote for the democratic process every time. If one day everyone decided to vote for a king, first of all, by voting for the king, they'd end the democracy. And secondly, if the democracy tried to preserve itself and like kicked out the king from the election, then they also stopped being a democracy. And it's the same with Marxism. And it's the same thing that I think would result in this sort of uh, philosopher state, right? It's, it's an idealist point of view. Sexual inequality, for example. This is the reason why I don't subscribe to Marxist theory. There's always going to be sexual inequality. Um, Christianity got the closest to solving this through monogamy, but it wasn't perfect. You still have, you know, infidelity. You still have certain women uh, basically being prostitutes their whole lives to fulfill a certain male need because men uh, crave, you know, this sort of... Um, uh, they have this sort of hunter instinct to, to to reproduction. They want to reproduce with as many women as possible, like Genghis Khan. Not everybody. And that spirit has been relatively subdued. But that's that's still a big thing for, for a good amount of people. So what I'm getting at here is presupposing that everybody would just get along and everybody would stay subscribed to, to this sort of harmony and collective non-aggression. Yeah, technically, it's possible. But that denies human nature. You would have to change human nature so radically in a way that we would stop being human. We would eventually be like ants who, who do exactly what they're told. But that's the thing. Even in these like anarchical systems, there's no one really telling people what to do. You just expect them to do what they're supposed to do without these other factors. So I hope that answers your question. Again, I'm, I'm being very long-winded, but I'm just trying to touch all the bases when it comes to these things. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. One thing I would consider with um, the people who possibly can't become a philosopher, those are the same people who are extremely susceptible to influence in the in the exact same way. And um, the ones who, I guess, don't have very impressive mental faculties, I also don't think they would be revolutionaries in the same way someone like Yukio Mishima would. Because as you were kind of describing, without that mental acuity, mm -hmm. how are you going to formulate the ideas to even formulate something like a revolution? But what I'd also say is truly intellectual people, I, I, I this you might disagree with this, mm -hmm. but I think the goal would always be um, through diplomacy rather than warfare, because I think, in my opinion, there's nothing rational about going to war because it's kind of it's always a lose. There's no sort of compromise between parties. And I would argue truly intellectual people would seek kind of a middle ground, balanced, nuanced approach to situations. Obviously, there's uh, limits to this because sometimes the balance on one side is much worse than the other side. And that's where you're kind of maybe like coursing at a point. But I also would think that people who are philosophers would have a sort of nuanced view on on that balance itself and wouldn't go so extreme to one side like for me I, i'm very much a centrist because i don't believe there's these robust answers or maybe i'm a pluralist as well so you, even even if you can't turn everyone into philosophers the people who you can't turn into philosophers i think they would be the least of your worries for obtaining power and na nowadays obtaining power is a bit different because of money but when you when you when you're talking about power, are you more so talking about influence or using them synonymously, or how are you saying it? Well, power has different manifestations, right? So you talk about mm. the pleb, let's call them the pleb, right, or the proletariat. Like, okay, well, these guys would never start a revolution. That may be correct. But what's stopping one of the philosophers who wants power to use those plebs, those proletariats, to their advantage? And this has happened all throughout history, time and time again. In fact, it's almost always happened. In fact, in every case that you have a um, a sort of you know great, powerful, charismatic leader come to power, it's it's oftentimes by convincing the masses to support them. Napoleon, Mao Zedong, Julius Caesar, even Julius Caesar did not have the support of the patrician class, which was the noble class. He was supported by the plebeians, the lower class. Um, Lenin, right? Um, Hitler, literally, all these you know very powerful leaders. They won because they knew how to manipulate the masses. And this is a very good skill um, to have. So I guess what I'm getting at is, yeah, the, it might not be the plebeian who actually starts a revolution, but there's nothing stopping one of the philosophers from doing it anyway. One of the intelligent people, because that's, that's what it is. All of these guys that I mentioned were very intelligent people. 
no matter how evil you want to consider them, you know, people don't realize, like, you know, Lenin, uh, Mao, Hitler, Mussolini, these were very intelligent people. They were very well read, and they knew exactly how to manipulate human psychology. So the will is to, to obtain power. Here's another thing, right? I think that, and this is not always the case, but a lot of the times the people that don't want power don't want it because they don't feel they can obtain it. People that feel they can obtain power generally take power. That's not always the case, but I think it generally is. So all you need is one person who feels that they can take power and they will take power. And if anything, because you've subdued the spirit of most people in this philosopher's state where no one's a warrior or less people are warriors, you know, most of them are just philosophers. Uh, now you've made it so much easier for one person who decides they want to be a warrior to just take everybody else out. And Lenin, uh, Vladimir Lenin has this great quote that says, one man with a gun can control a hundred men without one. Um, and there's, there's variations of this quote throughout history. It's like, um, uh, here's another great quote, actually. I think Alexander the Great said something along the lines of, uh, I'd rather be a lion in charge of sheep than, than a sheep in charge of lion. A lion, right? So it's very easy to manipulate the weak to support you in, in, in taking power. So, um, you know, I think that no matter what, and, and this is true of politics as well, you say, well, don't intelligent people compromise, right? Um, compromise is always done from a position of weakness because people that can take don't need to compromise. Compromise, if anything, will always favor one side over another unless the balance of power is split down the middle. So even in politics, compromise, like, you know, you call it compromise, but literally compromise is a simulation and it's an assessment and it's a estimation of the value and power between both sides. It's an estimation at the value of power. And warfare, there is no simulation. It's who is stronger. Politics is an estimation of strength. It's, you know, like Mao Zedong says, God, I'm quoting more communists than you are. What the hell? But um, <laughs> uh, Mao Zedong says, uh, war, uh, politics is war without bloodshed and war is politics with bloodshed. And he's, he's right. He's 100% correct. So what I'm getting at is politics is a simulation of war. It's just an inaccurate simulation. But ultimately, it has the same functions as warfare. Even in war, you do have compromise. In fact, <clears throat> I would argue you have more compromise in war because of the way peace deals work. With a peace deal, because of you know all the death and destruction, whatever you're like, shit. All right, now we we gotta we we gotta solve. Yeah, we gotta we gotta attain peace. You know, you see the real ramifications of everything. You see, you, you put all the cards on the table, and you're like, all right, we're gonna have a peace treaty. We know exactly how much we're hurting, how much you're hurting. You know, so the assessment of power is going to be a lot more accurate than politics, because you can't really assess power so well with politics. War is the greatest assessment of power. Combat is the greatest assessment of power. That's why, like, and here's why I hate diplomacy. And maybe that sounds bad, but, like, the reason why <laughs> men get along better than women get along with each other is precisely because men are more upfront about uh, facing issues. For example, men fighting each other is actually a very good thing. I think one of the big problems of, of today is that men don't just duke it out. I never have... I never feel anger towards somebody like I've, I've done martial arts with where I, like, let out all my anger doing a jujitsu role or doing a spar afterwards you're, you're golden because I think that psychologically we understand that combat is a very good way of settling differences because there's no subversion to it. You don't feel cheated. You just know you lost or you know you won and that sets things straight. And I, and that's why I, another reason I don't like this sort of modern liberal diplomatic process, I don't think it accurately reflects the winners and losers. So if people feel cheated, people will feel like uh, they got the short end of the stick. And that's not something that happens in a fight, you know, especially in warfare, you either live or you die, you know, if that's it, and it might sound very brutal. But that's how nature is. Nature is brutal. Like the, the squirrel doesn't complain that some snake ate him alive. It's like, well, shit, I'm a squirrel. That's a snake. I did not run fast enough. If he runs fast enough, the snake might, star snake might starve to death, you know? The squirrel can just as easily kill the snake as the snake can kill the squirrel by running away. So what I'm getting at here is when you have a clear outcome, it comes only from warfare, not from diplomacy. Diplomacy is an abstraction of war, and diplomacy is a assessment, an inaccurate assessment of the balance of power between two opposing forces or multiple opposing forces. And that is why I would disagree that having a world full of philosophers is better because if anything i'd want a world for if anything peace is probably more possible with a world full of warriors because then 
it's like what is peace really right um that's another conversation but it's like with i just feel like the, the more powerful forces you have the more strong people you have generally the better outcomes you're going to have with negotiation as well because people can back up their diplomacy with action it's like like the carrot with this and the stick right so when when you just make you you put all your cards on the line like this is my army this is your army you know uh i think it is it is helpful actually and i would say it's superior to to diplomacy and and you know just having a bunch of intellectuals uh discuss things and again i keep going on these long-winded things but i'm just like i said i'm just trying to touch all the bases here I understand, like, I understand what you're saying. Not that I absolutely agree with it. I, I guess I have such fundamental different thoughts on um, humans and what action is good or bad. Mm -hmm. Because in, in the sense that you're talking about, you do talk about warfare a lot. Yeah. Um, as a generally positive thing, not like war is bad, obviously, but this will to power that kind of manifests itself in war is this natural thing and i know you've talked about wanting the end goal is to kind of establish a one world government that's pretty antithetical to um warfare maybe it starts from warfare but how would something like that maintain itself if you don't have i guess in my opinion intelligent people i i don't know for for me it just I still, I still am struggling to see some sort of necessary connection because, in my opinion, I, I can tell you disagree with this through what your views are on human nature. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, warfare is necessary or power is something everyone wants. You said, um, I, I don't know how, how you would define the word power. That would be important for me to know. Yeah. But for example, I, I don't want power. And it's not that I don't think I can't attain, attain it. It's that my view of power through studying politics is that it is a coercive force influence is something i'd rather have because you're changing people's ideas in a rational way where you're both hopefully honest truth seekers whereas power is something that you're intentionally trying to make someone else's interests or your interests and then have someone else feel like your interests are their interests which is inherently coercive and i think it's um not fruitful to the group which humans are tribe-like in nature so i think these um course of tendencies that you're kind of alluding to as being natural natural are actually detrimental to, to any sort of group cohesion yeah so i would i would argue politics is more coercive because it relies upon trying to convince somebody i think that warfare is a very pure it's not coercive at all because it's like you, I guess it depends how you're trying to use the word coercive. Um, when you go to war with somebody or you get in a fight with somebody, there's no, like you, there's just that person in front of you. You have to beat them or you lose. Um, when it comes to politics, I think it's a lot more grimy and corrupt and dirty because if you can't, like, what are you going to do? Let's say this. Here, here, here'd be my argument, right? Let's say you can't convince people. Let's say somebody more powerful than you with more influence, with more money has convinced more people than you have. You've convinced five people. You've got me, you got your family, that's it. Your dog, maybe, right? He speaks English all of a sudden. Um, you've convinced five <laughs> people and a dog. And and let's say Jeff Bezos, for example, became the evil Lex Luthor and he has the ear of all of America. What are you going to do? You know, like what, you're just going to roll over and be like, well, I can't convince them. Too bad, right? And that's an extreme example, but let's let's tighten it up a little bit. Let's say... For example, right? Like, let's say you yourself um, live in, let's say Canada tomorrow. Decide, like, what's all right? Give me like an example of a, a government you probably wouldn't like. Like, you probably wouldn't want to live in North Korea, right? Probably not. No. <laughs> right. So this is gonna be an extreme hypothetical. But let's say tomorrow, let's say you had twenty percent of the population on your side, but the other eighty percent wanted to become North Korea. But let's say of those eighty percent, they're all fat and ugly and stupid. And they, they, they can't do anything, but they have to vote, right? They got 80% of the vote, so they can outvote you. And they can turn Canada and North Korea. But you and the 20% have guns, and you're smart, and you're strong, and you know if you go to war, you can beat these guys. Are you going to try to convince them, or are you going to go to war with them? 
I would definitely try to convince them because then I feel like I could take that same rhetoric and say, hey, we're having this conversation. I can't convince Patrick. I should just beat him up instead. But obviously that's no solution to anything because we're not getting any closer to truth. And talking about, like, for example, Plato and the Republic, the whole goal of a lot of conversations in that book aren't to dominate each other in conversation. It's to seek some sort of higher truth. And maybe maybe it's very, very difficult to find, but I would argue that's the end goal, um, is to seek something that we can kind of generalize to a lot of people. And th there's obviously always going to be people who disagree, but I would, I would never consider some sort of combat to be... Because it's not, it's not an, it's not a solution or an answer to anything. It's just stopping something. You see, I, I would argue that like power is truth and victory is truth because ultimately, you know, I understand where you're coming from because the sort of Platonist idea is that you can attain objective truth through uh, rationale, through discussion, right? And I would argue you can't. And this is the difference. Like I said, the reason why I brought up Hegel earlier. Hegel believes we can become. We can find that final state. We can find that objective truth. Nietzsche believes in a constant becoming, internal recurrence. And what that means is we are constantly in a state of burning. We are like fire, constantly burning. But fire is never still. Fire is always moving. Fire is always burning. And if it has no more fuel, it will burn out. That is what we are as humans. We are not something that just finds an end state and stays in that end state forever. And we've been raised to think this way. We have media where everyone lives happily ever after. We have this idea that you buy a house, you have two and a half kids, you have your white picket fence, you have your golden retriever, you have the furnished house, and you're complete. That's it. That's, you've attained that. You've won at life. That's very much how we've been raised. I don't think it's true at all. So when you say, for example, nothing is solved, right? I don't think anything is ever truly solved. Um, what you do is you, you live for the struggle and you live for the constant state of becoming. You live for the pursuit. Um, and I think the reason why I would argue that power is truth and by extension war is truth, and this is true historically as well, um, is that it is the best and most pure manifestation of truth because ultimately what is truth but not victory truth is whatever makes you the most successful group because like i said existence is the first priority of any group of any people of any individual that that comes first like actually i'll ask you like can you agree that like first of all you have to exist to do anything right that's i feel it's a given yes right so and you might think it's a false equivalency however if existence is the first priority and you know what i think there's there are lines to this right i think um like people don't want to just survive right you want to you want to thrive you want to live well um and i think that's a good thing and i understand like the concept of living well or dying well instead of living poorly i understand that i mean god that's what mishima did in, ex in a sense right so i understand that but ultimately existence as in power it's like and, and, you know, some aspects of it do contradict, contradict itself. But I think generally wanting to exist and, and to define power, because you asked me earlier, mm. power to me is control over the environment around you, which requires control over yourself oftentimes, or at least a certain element of control. Because the way that we describe power, um, if you take all the things that represent power today, they all equate to control, the military, control, money, control. That's what it is. It's control of your environment. So that that becomes the first priority because without control of your environment, you are beholden to your environment and you are at nature's will or you're at the will of other beings, other entities. So first and foremost, power comes first. And by extension, power becomes truth because existence becomes truth. Whoever exists ought to exist for the most part. And of course, there's freak accidents, you know, there might be some tsunami or volcano eruption, you know, we can't control nature. Maybe nature wins in the end. Um, uh, that's, that's also a theme to explore. However, when it comes to human types, I think generally the one who, who stands, the one who, who, who triumphs has truth on their side because it proved that their way of life ultimately was superior to others. And here's where there are some contradictions. Technically speaking, in the turn of the 20th, sorry, the, yeah, the, uh, yeah, turn of the 20th century, I always mix it up. Is turn the beginning or the end? Turn is the beginning. So uh, turn, the turn, page. turn is the beginning, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So in the turn of the 20th century, and, you know, technically, who triumphed in the 20th century, it was the United States. So you might say, well, 
clearly you're wrong, Patrick, because this liberal government won, right? And I think it's a good point to make, right? That it's like, well, historically, have have the guys who have focused on power won? And, and I would argue for the vast majority of history that it is the case. Um, and that's, that's an important thing to consider. The United States right now is also unnaturally in a position of power. They are not... The America is not powerful because of its doctrine. It's powerful because, literally, if you study the geography, this is a country that has no enemies on its borders, no dangerous neighbors. During times of war, it does not get bombed. Every single country in World War II got bombed, at least once, except for the United States. Uh, and Or the rest of the continent, obviously, too. But, I mean, every country that was involved, every major country involved in World War II got bombed during the war. The United States did not. The United States has insane oil reserves. It has insane arable land. We have so many natural resources. That's why the United States essentially won the 20th century. It's not because of the doctrine. So what I'm getting at is there are, um, there are variations to this, right? You might say, oh, well, here's, here's a time where this guy, these people are an antithesis, antithesis to what you're describing, and yet they won, right? So you have to focus. But what we're, we're trying to establish is that certain ideologies and doctrines maximize power. And that might be long-term. That might not be short-term. So right now, America might be on top, or right now, China might be on top. But ultimately, at the end of the day, whatever maximize power, maximizes power the most in the end, to me, is truth. And to me, whoever is most powerful wins when it comes to warfare, 99% of the time, with a few, um, a few, uh, what do you call it? A few, a few, Core, like a uh, variation, you know, a few moments where that proves fringe not examples. to be. Yeah, yeah a few fringe <laughs> examples. Th- exceptions. Exceptions. Well, I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Simple word I couldn't think of. I'm hitting all the words about that. <laughs> but for the most part, right? So to me, power is truth. I don't believe in objective truth, or it's not that I don't believe in objective truth, but I believe in one fundamental objective truth, and that is power. And I think everything stems from there. So, um, so I think that's where the, the disagreement is and sort of the overarching thing that will be the disagreement is I think that, you know, you say, well, nothing's been solved through war. Well, I would argue it has been solved. If anything, politics doesn't solve anything. If you're constantly compromising, no, nothing is solved because compromise is just not living to the fulfillment of your ideals. The only way you live to the fulfillment, fulfillment, <laughs> you know, to the, to the maximum of your ideals, because if you believe you're right, Hayden, right, and you had the power to not compromise, would you compromise? Uh, I guess it really depends on the situation. Right. But for the most part, if you believe, or if you truly believe you were right, uh, right, if you truly believe you're correct, because otherwise it means you don't really believe that you're correct. If you truly believe that what you believe in is the correct form of action, if you believe in objective truth, for instance, and somebody is in opposition to that, um, but you don't have to listen to them. You have defeated them. There's no reason for you to compromise with them. And it would be stupid to compromise with them. And you shouldn't compromise with them. So what I'm getting at here is, Compromise doesn't really solve anything, or it doesn't solve the full picture. The only thing that solves the full picture is complete victory. So now you can argue that, hey, none of us really know what's right. None of us really know what the correct course of action is. And that's sort of the tenets of liberal democracy, is that nobody really knows the answer. So it's actually a good thing that we have this diversity of opinion. But then all that means is that you yourself are reserving the fact that you may not be correct, that you may not know what's best. And that's fine. That's okay. But then you have to admit that, right? And um, it's important because when it comes to truth and when it comes to what you believe in, you're not going to achieve those aims through a liberal democracy. The only way you achieve those aims is through a maximization of will to power, which is warfare, combat, um, whether culturally or or actual warfare, because there are cultural ways to wage war as well. It's happening today to an extent. But victory is the only way that you can achieve your ends and it's the only way that you can prove that you are you know it's like the best way to prove who is right um and you know people like disagree with that i think there's like um one greek philosopher who said war doesn't determine uh who's right only who's left um but i think who's left generally does prove who's right um and you know for the most part it's not always true but for the most part and i think for most of human history Every single power that ever existed and that influenced the world in a positive way did so with war. The United States, for instance. 
did so with war. And of course, people will disagree whether the United States had a positive influence or not. But, you know, I would say that the positive influences that the United States had were through war. Napoleon, people don't realize the amount of reforms that Napoleon made in France that actually have impacts even to today. And he did so through war. That was his primary tool and instrument of power. The Persians, for example, they had a very prosperous empire and a very peaceful empire. But how did they get built? Through war. Uh, the Romans, for instance, you know, war. The British Empire, war. It's only in the modern age that we deny that war is what ultimately leads to the triumph and primacy of good things. And like war, I think when people say war is bad, I don't think war is either good or bad. It's just a reality of life. What's bad in war, for example, is, you know, innocent people getting massacred, for example, or, or atrocities taking place. But within that, you also have to look at the good, you know, the good and the bad get heightened through, through really explicit and raw events like warfare. Everything gets heightened, the good and the bad, the ugly, whatever, the beautiful. So uh, I apologize because I keep going on really long, but I am passionate about these things. And mm -hmm. um, I do think war ultimately is what determines truth. Truth is victory. Victory is the only thing. And it's not always true. Sometimes you have freak accidents, right? Like the dinosaurs deserve to be the god emperors of the universe. Then some meteors took them out, you know. But um, it's a joke, by the way. Please laugh. But <laughs> no, yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, but um, it's not always true, but I think it's a lot more true than compromise. To me, the only benefit of a liberal democracy is if you yourself don't know if you're correct. That's the only way it works. So then compromise can have a positive function. Of course, it's not something I agree with because I don't support this sort of parliamentary system as an end state. But if you want to talk about the positives of uh, liberal democracy and what it aims to do, it aims it aims to to solve the problem that nobody is quite right. You know, and this is sort of a postmodernist idea as well. Postmodernism tries to deconstruct identities because it's afraid one identity will dominate the others. So that's where the disconnect is. And I think it's just something that you either will, will buy into or not buy into. But I will say this, and I will ask you this as a question. So my first question would be, do you think that your ideas are right and should be implemented? And secondly, do you think that the liberal democratic system is good for your ideology because you might not think you're right and maybe those alternate opinions balance out your beliefs? Um, I am someone who carries opposing thoughts on pretty much everything, not because I don't trust myself, because I am quite a pluralist in that sense where I think there's multiple answers to multiple situations there's no cut and dry sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and your question about the liberal democracy sword, you mind repeating it about if it would, if my ideas would fit in a liberal democracy. So I, I guess I'm saying, um, so the, the, I gave you the, so the contrast was if you believe you're right, if you believe mm -hmm. you're completely right, why would you want a liberal democracy? Or on the flip side, do you actually see value in a liberal democracy? Because you don't think you could be completely right. And maybe, like I, in an ideal world, the other political parties that you must compromise with fill in the gaps in what you're not correct about. I'm just steel manning I... liberalism, that's all. <laughs> mm -hmm, I know. <laughs> I'm more so not a huge fan of liberalism because it takes an approach, especially in the manifestation of capitalism, that everyone's uh, individual interests can mutually benefit everyone else, which I don't think is true i think eventually you hit this point where there's too much tension um i think though still the goal definitely not in a liberal democracy because the whole point if it's a democracy you would have to convince everyone that what you're saying is right and if you think you're right then you're not going to want a democracy because that will challenge your rightness so i think any sort of uh, objectivism true objectivism when i talk about objectivism it's kind of like that endless pursuit of what is the truth because i don't think you'll ever hit a point where you go okay yeah we found it y you won't be able to know it'll just be this kind of advancement in your um ideas as you move forward mm -hmm. but with a democracy if i if i establish to myself and this is my position that i'm incorrigible then what's the point of democracy if i'm always right then what like what's there to talk about at this point right but i also think that that's the exact same thing that happens with totalitarian leaders 
end. I mean, I couldn't name a single totalitarian leader who was good. So I think not being able to hold those pluralistic views where you are able to challenge your own, um, I guess, strength in what your ideas are, then you kind of end up as being this uh, despotic leader, in my opinion. So it definitely wouldn't fit in a liberal democracy because democracy as a whole goes against just one central idea. The whole point of it is people have different ideas. How can we give weight to those different ideas? Correct. And this is why I would say you do support despotic leaders. You just don't consider them despotic because they lived in a different time. And I'll explain. It's like, do you would you say that every single Roman emperor and, and, and they had some checks and balances on their power, but so do so do like dictators, okay? Like you know, Putin has checks and balances. Uh, Xi Jinping has checks mm-hmm. and balances. Even um, I or not Hitler. Hitler had pretty much absolute power, and so did Stalin. But besides them, uh, most most dictators have checks and balances. Um, but like, would you like would you say that the Roman the Roman Empire had good emperors who were good leaders? I I want to say I think a big difference between a despot and a leader is a despot is someone who's like cruel. They're going to do things in a in a negative way when it comes to the manifestation of their control. But a leader, I we've talked about this too, kind of forming through meritocracy. Those are the type of people who want the best for the collective, and I I think the uh, emperors would have wanted that because you were explaining this to me, mm-hmm. they're usually the people who succeeded in warfare and then it was this kind of trade between, okay, now there's a new best um, soldier or whatever, they're kind of going to move up the ranks when and it then well. end up in a place. <laughs> yeah, and it worked well, but that's when it, not when a despot. That's... It yeah, sorry, when it worked well. Yeah, yeah. But, that's, um, but then... that's not really a despot to me, that's just a leader. But then isn't that just saying that a despot is a bad leader? So isn't it kind of a self-fulfilling statement you know what i mean that would be like that would be like me saying a bad leader is is not a good leader which is like obviously true but i i mean because i think what we're talking about is is a is a leader with increased if not absolute authority right is that a despot because somebody can have that authority and not use it cruelly in fact um so like i would i would even argue that like i said there's been plenty of um i mean all of europe for example did not have a, a liberal government, the first uh, real liberal government, if you don't include merchant republics like Venice and uh, Genoa, whatever, the first like actual republic, I think, maybe it was the Batavian Republic, which was uh, Netherlands, but that was very short-lived. Let's say the first real one, maybe France. Um, so for, like that, that was like not till the late 1700s and only for like a few years before Napoleon came along and wrote, or Robespierre first and then Napoleon or whatever and became a dictatorship again. Um, well, there's another leader, right? Napoleon, I think, was was a fantastic leader, and, and most people will say so historically. Um, but like most of Europe is is ruled by by uh, autocrats, essentially, and depending on how you want to use the term. It's only in the past, say, two three hundred years, that you have uh, dictators, right? And and even within that, I think historically there have been leaders who have proved to be have been better than than the actual presidential leaders, um, and like. Um, even in American politics, whenever we're in a time of war, the president generally takes on relative dictatorial uh, authorities, especially during World War II. FDR had incredible power over the American government, and and you know he almost was a dictator. Very similar to the Romans. Uh, the Romans, what they did was, I believe it started with Marius, uh, but whenever there was a time of war where they thought they were going to lose, they were like, all right, we need you in power longer, so we're going to put you... We're gonna renew your uh, consulship because usually it only last, lasted a year, um, but like it would it would end up lasting seven years. Same with FDR. FDR served four terms. That's unheard of. He served sixteen mm-hmm. years. So even within and you know I'm not even saying FDR was a good leader, but he was certainly an effective leader. You know, people I might disagree with certain aspects of his politics, um, but he was he was a good leader in terms of being effective. Uh, so what I'm getting at is. There's plenty of leaders who end up taking on sort of dictatorial authorities who have who have been uh, beneficial and that like a lot of presidents end up taking dictatorial authorities at certain times. Um, I think it's just a matter of what does one do with that authority? Is it positive, negative, whatever? 
So, yeah, I mean, uh, to say someone's like a despot, for example, that's kind of by definition bad, right? It's like saying a bad leader is not a mm-hmm. good leader. So I guess what I'm getting at is, yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do see what you're saying. I think with some of those situations, especially because given the context that it's war, those are very much bordering on the instance of your hand is being forced in terms of what action you can do, where it, I mean, the options you have are limited, where if war is um, imminent, you're either going to fight or not fight. And if you don't fight, then you have no chance of winning. If you fight, you have a chance of winning. But if war is inevitable, then it is, isn't it always inevitable that a country will have to take on dictatorial authorities at some point? And then it's like, well, if you're going to do it sometimes, then why don't you just do it all the time? You know, um, that's co- sort of saying that Carl Schmidt talks about. He's, um, he's one of mm-hmm. the uh, most uh, prolific criti- critics of, of liberalism in the 20th century. Um, but I mean, it's like something to consider. It's like, well, if you're willing, if you admit that an autocratic form of government is better during certain times when your country needs it, like martial law, for example, well, why would you retain the ability to use martial law? Then it's saying, well, you know, sometimes we need to be a dictatorship, you know? Um, I don't know. I guess what I'm getting at here is like, the most effective way to implement policies that you believe are correct is if you have relatively, you know, absolute authority. And of course, there's there's variations of this, right? Like even, like I said, pr- dictators, quote unquote, today, pretty much all of them have checks and balances to some degree, mm-hmm. right? Um, but, you know, the, generally, I think if you want to make real change, you need the authority to make that change. And the problem with liberal democracy is that you don't have the tools to make those changes because by definition, the system's not supposed to change. The system was orchestrated so that the party lines would switch every eight years, four to eight years for the most part. Like, you you know, so you've constructed a system that's not supposed to change or it's supposed to be very difficult to change. So if you, so really it only just, it just assumes everyone it just, it really only just benefits a very specific class, which is whoever makes money because it doesn't matter if you can make money doesn't really matter if you're leftist, rightist, whatever, and certain policies will affect you, whatever. But a centrist, moderate government helps one group, and that's the wealthy, historically. So, ultimately, when you sort of analyze this and you look at the implications of, okay, well, you know, there's the term absolute power corrupts absolutely, but I don't really think that's like, and power is it's just an inevitability. War is an inevitability. Power is an inevitability. It's only about who has it. Like even today, you could say, well, we live in a free society. Yeah, and we live in a free society when compared to like China. But somebody has a level of authority higher than you. It always will happen. There's always going to be someone more powerful than you unless you're the most powerful person in the world. It should be pretty chill. But because of that, there is always some level of like... Uh, inequality that exists and because of that it's like it's not about are we free or do we live in a dictatorship it's like you know how is your how are you being oppressed essentially um i don't know it's just that i mean (laughs) we definitely strayed from the original conversation point a little bit yeah i was gonna say (laughs) but um the reason why and i think the reason why it led to this is because what i'm trying to illustrate is that I'll just lay the cards on the table. If you believe you're right, then you should absolutely take the opportunity to establish your your point of view and to establish the policies in line with your ideals, if you believe you're right. Um, secondly, to do that, you need power. And thirdly, to, to have power, you need physicality, whether in yourself or others. Somebody's going to have to do the dirty work. So why not understand what it's like to actually do that? And that's another thing with leading from the front. Um, it's, you know, violin player aside, let's say you're the president of a country. Um, being a, some out of shape person who gorges of cheeseburgers all the time, why their country stars, for example, like look at Kim Jong-un, you know, what a, what a bizarre situation, you know, half your country's starving and you're this fat, jolly man. It makes no sense. You should live up to the ideals like a leader should live up to the highest point of all ideals in his society, physically and mentally. 
Um, and I think all people should live up to an ideal. If something can only help you, then you should maximize that. And being physically fit can only help you. Now, how much time you put into it is the question, right? I'm not asking everyone to go on steroids and become like a freaking MMA fighter who trains four hours a day, but everyone can put in an hour into the gym and it can only help you. There's no reason why somebody should be fat or should be like really skinny and out of shape. And it's only going to help your psyche. It's only going to help your mentality. And it's only going to help everybody around you. Therefore, this fusion of the physical and, and, and the mental, you know, it has real, real necessity in real life and also has a necessity for the soul as well. And it's what synthesizes you and balances you and creates a good level of harmony. Um, and, you know, I think if we revisit this topic, we should just bring out the book and like read, we should just do a reading of the book so that way we don't stray too, <laughs> too far off. <laughs> But um, that would probably be a good idea. Yeah. I, I think one of my biggest problems is that evaluating people on um, their appearance or things like this, which even if they can control it, I honestly don't really care. Or even if they live an extremely degenerate life, but they're talking magnificent things, it would just be ad hominem of me and fallacious to think, oh, their um, ideals are any less valuable than someone else, even if they aren't representing them. I guess I, I have a very different perspective on things than m maybe most people who find Sun and Steel so amazing. Just because I, I guess I don't I don't see the connection as relevant. It's certainly not completely irrelevant, but as a necessity, yeah, maybe a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition, I'd sort of question still. I don't know I think I think it would be good to go more specific into, um that discussion more because I am totally open to having my mind changed. But uh, for example, a lot of your discussion is coming from, well, this situation will come about, so we should prepare for it. I, I, I kind of am under the impression that things like these can be superseded and maybe I'm a complete outlier in that view, but it, it would make it harder for me to see these things as totally necessary, like warfare. If, in my opinion, it's something that is just fundamentally not necessary, even if n not always diplomacy is the best answer, but some sort of, I guess, higher form of living, which we've talked about, like a higher ideal. What do you make that higher ideal? That doesn't have to be warfare. It can be something peaceful, but I'm not sure. I I, I didn't really get to say too much to give <laughs> no, my opinion, bad. which isn't a bad thing. <laughs> no, I, it's I it, it's no bit. worries. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I really want some sort of super I not that what you're saying isn't robust and not that it's like okay yeah that's a considerable thing but in terms of I always look for the the goal and I I, I don't know I, I know it's kind of hard to say because I, I just look at these things so differently yeah I mean to me the goal is to find a state where we are constantly expanding and like that's that's the goal is never to stop. It's just to constantly strive. And like, let's say we form into one world government. I've always said, you know, space is the next frontier. You know, mm -hmm. I think you can conquer war, but you can never conquer war as the spirit of war. The spirit of war will always exist. You can only conquer the functions of war, which is killing and whatnot. But you'll never, you'll never subdue the spirit of war. So unless you have a system that uses that spirit, that utilizes that spirit then there will always be problems. And like I said, inequality, like, do you think that equality can ever actually be established? Are you talking about equality in the sense of human rights or in the sense of us as individuals, like, are we equal? Like value, ability to do things. Or, I mean, because here, here's, you know, I'll just, instead of asking the question, I'll, I'll present the point I'm trying to make just to save time because I got to catch this uh, debate you know, shout, <laughs> shout out, shout out to the debate <laughs> um, between Sleepy uh, Joe and <laughs> Trump. Yeah, exactly. Looking forward to it. But um, um, the point I'm trying to make is, um, so the reason I ask you is, is total quality possible? I don't. First of all, I don't think total quality is the only re way that you can enforce total equality is if you have an overarching authority who enforces it, which automatically makes 
the society unequal, even if you have one tyrant. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea with God, Christian God, is God is above everyone else and everyone else is relatively equal. And there's different, uh, there's different interpretations depending on what specific sect, like some, some Christians will say like, well, and this is biblically, uh, something you could cite is like some people are closer to God than others, like sitting at the right hand of the father, for example. Right. But generally speaking, all Christians, maybe not equal exactly. Cause some people go to hell or whatever, but for the most part, people in heaven are all supposed to be equal. Um, that's like technically a form of equality. If you had one all powerful God that lived on the earth, like a human God, like, let's say you had like, um, Superman or whatever, and he forces everyone to be equal. Like, no, everyone will have exactly one wife and exactly one house and exactly 10 acres that you can farm. Sure. But even then it's not equal anymore because you're placing one person above everybody else. The only way you ensure equality is through inequality. There's always going to be some level of inequality in the world. And so long as you have inequality, you have envy, you have resentment because people don't want to be equal. People want to have more than other people. So to me, the goal is not to create the most equal society, but to create the society that benefits the person with the strongest will and the most talent, the person who deserves the power. That's the whole idea with nature. The idea with nature is that the correct animal triumphs and the incorrect animal is eaten or dies. If they're a predator, they can't catch the deer. Too bad. You're dead. That's what I think fairness is. And you can't just have survival the fittest, you know, like put people in a gladiator arena and like, all right, whoever wins this is the king human um, because humans are different than animals. You know, in mm -hmm. the primate kingdom, it's not necessarily the strongest ape that leads the the tribe. It's not. You know, this is proven. It's not the strongest ape. It's the one who is able to lead the best. And humans are similar. And survival the fittest for humans is a combination of intelligence and strength. And yeah, it seems like intelligence is more important, but I absolutely think that strength influences intelligence. And I don't mean strength like become a juice head bodybuilder. I mean, if you want to, go ahead, I guess. But um, uh, that's not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person who lives to the to the extent of all ideals. That's the only way you can truly maximize the power of the mind, in my opinion, because it gives you perspective. It's like reading something in a book versus seeing it in person. You learn a lot more by living amongst people of another culture than you could in a book about them. You learn more by feeling the power of like just a piece of stone, you know, just a piece of stone that has lived throughout history. You know, you ever go to like a historical site or whatever, or you ever see something really beautiful. That's always going to be infinitely more powerful than seeing a picture, than reading about it, than imagining it. Actually being there is what matters. And ultimately, what are ideals, if not, you know, concepts which are trying to lead you to the best life? And, and does the best life make sense if you're not the healthiest, happiest person you could be? And like, I don't mean happiness in a lame pursuit of happiness individual way. I mean, fulfillment, right? The only way you could be truly fulfilled is by seeking the physical ideal alongside the mental ideal. I'm not saying everyone needs to be juice heads, but everybody can be physically fit and not everyone can be that smart. So that's why I think that we make a special emphasis on the physical ideal. But to conclude, you know, I'm sorry for talking so much today. It's just, it's okay. I have a lot of thoughts on these things as you can tell. And I feel bad because mm -hmm. I, I do want to hear your thoughts. I just, I feel like I really need to, you know, put the nail down on these things. But to close off, what I'll say is, um, because everyone can fit the physical ideal and not everyone can fit the mental ideal, then that sort of aesthetically takes priority. And I absolutely do judge people off of their appearances because I have found, and I think it's true psychologically, that the body is a lot of times a reflection of the soul. And what I mean by this is because of the factors that I mentioned. And I see this in like good people who are like, you know, fat and obese or whatever. It's like, there's always some part of them that does not capture the full representation of life because they themselves are lacking in one way. So like a, it's like a fat person, for example, I, I mean, it's, it, it gets down to a very functional level too. Like I don't commit, consider Samoans fat. Like they're naturally big people. Like you ever see like a Samoan rugby player. That's not fat mm -hmm. to me. Like they're naturally obese, but they're not fat really. It's just how they are. And they're still in very good shape. Right. 
what I consider someone fat is somebody that's delibitated. You know, that is that can't run a mile, that can't run a couple miles. That's the basic thing every human should do. Every human should be able to run three miles without like um, going out of breath. That's literally what we were built for. We were built to run for miles. And if you can't do that, then you're missing an aspect of life, which is beautiful. If you can't hike up a hill to go see a beautiful view, you're missing a part of life. Being healthy is 100% essential to fulfillment. It's 100% essential to affirming life and to truly living life and to truly being invested in life. And that all funnels up to the mind. And I think what I'm going to do in the meantime between this and our next talk is I'm going to do some research so I could better explain to you. Because right now I'm, I'm using a lot of um, allegories and symbolism and stuff. And I'd like to, mm -hmm. you know, actually present some things that you can look at, right? Um, but it all ends up funneling back to the mind. It all ends up impacting your psyche. It ends up impacting how you interact with the world, how you think. Mishima talked about that. And like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I genuinely believe it when I say somebody's body often reflects the soul. It shows how much they affirm life. And some people take steroids and, you know, that's not super accurate. But somebody, you know, let's, let's talk about a natural person for, for, for uh, conversation's <laughs> sake. It's like you see someone who's naturally strong and healthy, you know, that's somebody like naturally, that is somebody who is affirming life to its totality. They get enough time in the sun, you know, being out in nature is important. Like that shit's important. Like people don't realize it. All these things connect. Um, everything that affirms life connects and people don't realize this. So, I mean, like I said, I'll give you a better account next time with some analytical stuff, but that's generally <laughs> my view. Mm -hmm. I see it. I, I think there's uh, definitely one thing that seems to be equated sometimes in, in conversations like this is experience versus pure physicality. For example, like going to see a mountain, mm -hmm. obviously that can't be achieved if you're morbidly obese. Yep. But I think most people aren't in the case where they're so morbidly ob obese that it's impossible. I do think experience is good. I think that's pretty much inarguable. You mm -hmm. need some amount of experience just in a generality of things but I, I still I guess question obviously I'm not saying oh yeah just go be obese but whether or not that is a true representation of people because even the person who looks extremely robust on the outside can be deeply flawed on the inside and maybe that's something we could talk about next time because sure the one of the best ways you can conceal your flaws is through portraying yourself outwardly in this fabulous way or I idealistic way which it, it isn't really representing anything it's more so representing your insecurities not that everyone who's strong is insecure so that's definitely something i i consider as well with the argument about like the manifestation of your ideals in the body mm -hmm. because sometimes the manifestation of those ideals is to hide those ideals a little bit at the same time so there's this i guess um dichotomy between the two and i would like to get into it more definitely yeah and i do have thoughts on that so we'll uh write that down somewhere and we'll revisit it okay <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah i know this I, I get i get we uh i know i talked a little bit long today and went a bit off topic but uh still think there it's a valuable discussion to be had we can place this as episode one for yeah, exactly. this talk. Yeah. So it was like Mishima for the first 15 minutes. <laughs> and then liberal democracy for the next hour and 15. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, well, yeah, good good talk, man. And um, yeah, I've, I've got nothing else for the crowd. Uh, Hayden is wrong. Mishima is the best. Everyone who disagrees is a loser. That's what I'm going to end up with. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but... Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm still I'm still on the fence about many things. Like I said, I'm a pluralist. I hope you guys did enjoy this conversation anyways. We're definitely, this definitely isn't the end of it because I think we need a bit better back and forth yeah. Yeah, to sorry. really establish some sort of, it's, it's okay, to really establish some sort of robustness to both of our ideals, I guess. But anyways, let us know what you think if, you're totally siding with Patrick. I know I haven't said much yet, but <laughs> <laughs> just, Mishima, yeah. Mishima. Thank you guys for watching it and, and making it this far. Have a good day. We'll see you in the next one. All right. Peace out guys.